Well, good evening, everyone. And much as I'd like to talk about half-naked male musicians, um, sadly, I'm just a scientist, so instead I'm going to talk to you about an idea. And the idea I want to sell you is that we are now facing a situation that could be comparable to climate change, although none of us have really taken this on board. If we're indulging in memories, I remember some 20 or 30 years ago when I was working in France, a colleague of mine showed me a picture of a rather hairy individual wearing socks and sandals and beard and feral sweater, not there's anything against those things, saying, look, he's a member of the Green Party. And these green people are really weird. Um, and indeed, he was rather like a Martian at the time. Now, of course, we all accept that there is climate change. It breaks down into complex issues, that uh, there's degrees of controversy, that some people think we're doomed, some people think it's exaggerated, some people think, I'm one of them, that science can help. But it is a complex umbrella term um, when we talk about um, climate change. And what I'd like to suggest to you is that we're facing something we haven't yet recognized, comparable to my mind, even more sinister and exciting in equal measure, which is mind change. And here we have uh, when I unveiled this term to the Guardian. Uh, so what do we mean by mind change? Well, of course, that does beg the question, what is the mind? And I'm sorry to get heavy on you, but this is what happens if you invite a scientist into the party. I'm afraid uh, they start showing you slides like this. Um, and this is how you started your life. So we start on the left, there you are, newborn, the blobby bits. I'm assuming that if there's any neurologist or neuroscientist here, they're keeping a low profile. <laughs> okay, so um, the newborn, as you can see, blobby bits of brain cells, and as you can see, we go three months, 15 months, and two years, and everyone will notice the blobby bits stay the same, but the stringy bits increase, and what this means is it's the connections between the brain cells that proliferate and account for the growth of the brain after birth. Hence, even if you are a clone, an identical twin, you will have a unique configuration of brain cell connections because, and if you're going to remember anything, remember this, it's because those connections are formed and sculpted by your experiences. This is what we call plasticity, meaning, of course, not that the brain is plastic in the uh, modern sense, but rather from the plasticos to mold. Um, and what really is exciting is you can see the embryo of the fetus in the early postnatal brain cell Finally, the mature brain cell, where there is a growth of the branches that come from the cell. Why should this be exciting? It's because that increases the surface area of the cell, and hence it can more, make, make more connections. Um, so as you are born, you're born into a booming, buzzing confusion where you evaluate the world in terms of raw senses, how sweet, how fast, how cold, how bright. But gradually what will happen is as you can make connections, you see one thing in terms of something else. And so we will shift from what we call a sensory take of the world, where everything is just deconstructed to raw sensations, into a so-called cognitive, from the Latin cogito, I think, cognitive take of the world, where you see something standing for something else, um, all due to your ability of your brain cell, the harder it works, to forge branches so you can make connections. So far, so good. I would call this the biological basis of the mind, that is to say, the personalization of the brain through your unique experiences. However, as you can see, sometimes things go wrong, and you can recapitulate infancy with senescence or dementia. And this is not a natural consequence of aging, but it's a disease of older people where you have a pruning back of those branches so the connections atrophy, and therefore you go back into the confusion and disorientation that some would recognize as Alzheimer's disease. So let's think then of this mind in this physical, banal, um, scientific way, rather than some airy-fairy alternative to the squalor of the biology that I'm often condemned for trafficking in. Um, and here's an example. Um, imagine three groups of adult human volunteers, none of whom could play the piano. And if ever, I know this is unlikely, if ever you get to volunteer for such an experiment, a word of advice, don't be the control group. <laughs> uh, because they stared at a piano for five days. Yeah. However, the second group had much more fun. They learned five-finger piano exercises. But there was a third group. The third group I'm going to keep as a surprise as we look at the brain scans over five days of these three groups of rookie pianists. So here we go. Top group over five days. You can see the brain is literally unimpressed. <laughs> Nothing's happened. I don't know why that's funny, but still, never mind. <laughs> Um, meanwhile, the people that learned five-finger piano exercises, as you can see, astonishing change in brain territory relating to the digits, even over five days. But, and this is something that is really exciting, look at these guys. They merely imagined they were playing the piano. Appreciative sighs and gasps, yeah? And so I would therefore challenge any 
Anyone who thinks the mind is separate from the brain, anyone who thinks that um, one can divorce mental events from physical events, clearly a mere thought has physical purchase in the brain. So everything you do, everything you are, everything you're thinking, right now your brain is changing and evolving. You're not the same person you were a minute ago. And it's this that I find so exciting and astonishing and, if you like, scary about the human brain as opposed to your heart or your lungs or your liver, is that it is the essence of you. And the more you live your life, then the more your brain will adapt and evolve and become ever more individual as you get older. So, if that is the case, what does that mean for the effects of the screen? Now, we're living in a world, if you think that the human brain has evolved to adapt to any environment, which is why we occupy more ecological niches than any other species on the planet, to my mind, it's a given. If the environment's changing, the brain will change too. And we have to work out, is it good or bad? Do we want it or we don't want it? So let's think about screen culture. Um, I would suggest a shorter attention span. We know that prescriptions for methylphenidate, that's to say anti-attention um, deficit disorder drugs, has um, trebled in the last 15 years. Um, there's now about 50,000, 60,000 prescriptions for Ritalin for kids. Could this have anything to do, I just suggest, with the fact that many kids are now sitting in front of a screen with boom, bang, a bang, um, a fast succession of images. The second is perforce it is strongly sensory. I don't know how one could show a metaphor on a screen very easily. I have a small brother who I used to bully if we're indulging in childhood memories. Um, I was 16 and he was three, and I used to force him to learn Shakespeare. I thought this was quite funny. And as someone says, well, that must have gone a storm in playgroup, you know, and he walked in and saying, tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. And when he got to out, out, brief candle, had you said to him, Graham, what does it mean, out, out, brief candle? He would, of course, replied, um, well, you have a candle and you blow it out. Um, he wouldn't have seen it as a metaphor for death. He was only three years old. Um, so how would you show that if you were just trafficking mainly in visual images? How would you show to someone a metaphor? How would you show the path less trodden? Uh, how would you show um, in an out-out brief candle if you are dealing in what you see is what you get? So this is a sensational world that lacks metaphor or abstract concepts. Um, another problem I find is process versus content. It's all very well to have a mental agility, and indeed some people have said that uh, the increase in IQ scores that is actually characteristic of many of societies across the Western world could be attributable to playing lots of computer games because you're rehearsing the same skills as looking at uh, patterns and sequences and within a certain time frame getting to a very clear answer. But has also been pointed out, although IQ scores have written, the number of symphonies have not, nor has insight into the economic situation improved that much, um, and therefore nor into literature or history. So we have to separate out process from understanding, and I think this is a very fundamental difference between information versus knowledge. Information is not knowledge. When you play a computer game to rescue the princess, do you truly care about the princess? Hands up, well, I can't see you all in the dark, I don't know who cares about the princess, but if you read a book, I bet you care about the princess, otherwise you wouldn't read the book. And that is a difference between embedding something in a content where you understand it, and you see one thing in terms of another, versus a mental agility, which is great if you're driving, great for information processing, but all you're doing there is being a kind of second-rate computer. You're responding very quickly to information, your attention is fragmented on a screen, you hypertext, you respond to what you think might be better or worse um, than something else, but that is not the same as understanding. Um, or, uh, as I say, content. Um, reduced empathy is another issue, um, we all know that eye contact uh, and body language takes up some 50% of the impact you have on someone, voice tone about 30%. No one's evaluated touching someone or pheromones, the sneaky subliminal chemicals. None of those things are available on Facebook. <laughs> so therefore, if you're a kid with your oh-so-plastic brain, your oh-so-adaptive brain, and you are rehearsing relationships that don't have body contact, eye contact, voice, tone, pheromones, how on earth are you going to communicate with people when you see them face to face if you haven't rehearsed those things? And you may feel uncomfortable, in which case you will have more recourse to going back to your 900 friends on Facebook rather than the one person you go for a walk in the rain with. Um, and I suggest that some of the terrible things we see with happy slapping, that's to say bullying someone and putting it on YouTube, may be attributable to the fact that people literally don't understand what other people are feeling now. Um, and what does that say about identity? If you're doing something 
that has no consequences, and I would submit that playing computer games, um, you can just play the game again, is a very dangerous lesson to learn that actions don't have consequences. If actions don't have consequences, I'll suggest they're meaningless. And if you're doing something that's very meaningless most of the time, what does that say about you? And what does that say about your identity if you're living in the moment? And there's no past or future because it has no meaning and you're atomized into the present moment. Could it be that you might be meaningless and could it be you need consolation and therefore you might go onto something like Twitter and say, look at me, I'm doing this, mummy. Look at me, I'm doing that. Could it be that people that tweet a lot are indeed in existential crisis? <laughs> Finally, because I'm up against the clock here as I'm going to coming across as the nasty tip. I, I know I'm conforming to the stereotype of the Luddite scientist. But no. um, recklessness. If, oh, thank you. <laughs> if, one, if one asks a neuroscientist talk about risk, we say, well, let's look at neurological cases of recklessness where people take too much risk. And um, what we know there is that children, there's various groups of people that take risks. Children, um, people who are obese, actually, uh -huh. Yes, they, they, pay, they, they take greater risk while gambling, um, as shown here, compulsive gamblers, and finally schizophrenics, characterized by this very famous set of paintings where you have a cognitive cat on the top left. By bottom right, when I'm standing in the way, I don't think anyone would say that was a cat. I used to show this for Oxford entrance exams for medicine to ask what this meant. And there's a kind of deconstructed sensory image of a cat. Well, it's not a cat. It's just a lot of sensory blurs showing that the schizophrenic person has gone from cognitive to sensory, whereas we've seen that in development you go from sensory to cognitive. And I think that what these people have in common, children, um, compulsive eaters, gamblers, and schizophrenics, is that the premium is put on the thrill of the moment rather than on the consequences. Anyone who gambles knows the consequence of gambling, but the thrill outweighs that. Anyone who eats knows the consequence of eating, but the thrill of the food outweighs. Children aren't aware of the future. They're living in their literal what you see is what you get moment. And all these people have something in common, which is an underactive frontal part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which only develops late in teenage years. So what I'm wondering is could this common factor of the press of the senses, where you have literally a sensational time. By the way, who would like to come out with me tonight and have a cognitive time? I don't think anyone. Um, is due to, is due to, here we have, I'm sorry to do this to you, it's so late in the evening with so much wine, here we go. Um, here you have chemical fountains in the brain. Um, this chemical dopamine, which some of you may have heard of, actually inhibits that frontal part of the brain. And it's like a kind of chemical fountain. Now, dopamine can be linked to... I hope this is coming up. Yeah, where are we? Yes, it can be linked to arousal, it can be linked to addiction, and it can be linked to reward. Um, every drug, every psychotropic drug, has the final common path of releasing dopamine, whether it's morphine or cocaine or whatever, you'll have dopamine release. So we know that dopamine um, actually translates into um, these feelings. And my suggestion is that these are all features also, or can be, of computer games or internet addiction and, and preoccupation with cyber activities. So could we therefore be risking a next generation of underactive prefrontal cortex? and infantilizing. So we can think briefly of two modes for the human brain. Uh, the prefrontal under function and activation as characterizes adults, so you have strong feelings on the one hand, thinking on the other, we could call it sensory versus cognitive, living in the here and now versus the past, present and future. Uh, the external environment driving your sensations, whereas here internal perceptions and continuity of self carries on. Here, little meaning or significance, what you see is what you get. One thing isn't seen in terms of something else. Here, a highly personalized meaning. So instead of being a load of blurs, it'll be your mum that you see, different from what someone else sees. Here, a reduced sense of self. After all, you've let yourself go. You've blown your mind. You're out of your mind. The very word ecstasy in Greek is to stand outside of yourself. What I find fascinating is we pay money to do this. Think about it. It's really interesting. And we talk about having a sensational time, not having a cognitive time. Okay, wine, women, and song, drugs, and sex, and rock and roll all have this abrogation of sense of self as opposed to normal adult consciousness, which is driven by a continuity, an illusion, if you like, or whatever. Nonetheless, a continuity linking a past, a present, and a future. Here, no time and space. Here, a clear time-space reference. This is infants and children. This is older children and adults. Unless you take drugs, sex, and rock and roll, or unless you play computer games. There we are, that's more dopamine, that's less dopamine, and there we are, that could supersede it, World of Warcraft being one example. 
So could we have a continuous cycle here? This is the model. Intense stimulation of the screen mandates fast responses because it's exciting. That, in turn, uh, gives you a high level of arousal correlated with levels of dopamine release, and therefore you have reward-seeking addictive behavior, more dopamine release that um, inhibits the prefrontal cortex, immolating conditions of childhood, schizophrenia and obesity, where the drivers for sexual cognition, and therefore you have a greater appeal of the screen environment. Could that be happening to your children? So, the student of the future, I would suggest there's good and bad. Um, higher IQ, shorter attention span, improved short-term memory possibly. Um, icons versus ideas, a sensory emphasis, less empathy, less risk averse, and what other, yes, and less sense of identity. Now, some of these are good, some of them are bad. No one would not mind their kids having higher IQs, improved short-term memory, and being perhaps less risk averse. But would you want someone to have less empathy, less sense of identity? I doubt it. So what we need to do is to actually harness these technologies, um, contrary to what many think I say um, in the interests of simplistic journalism. I don't say that. I say that these are powerful technologies and the brain is sensitive to those technologies and we are missing a trick. We are missing a trick and we are falling short for the next generation if we don't talk and think about this. Um, even the CEO of Google, sorry, I've missed him there. Where's he gone? Even the CEO of Google is alert to this. I worry that the level of interrupt, the sort of overwhelming rapidity of information, is in fact affecting cognition. It's affecting deeper thinking. I still believe that sitting down and reading a book is the best way to really learn something, and I worry that we're losing that. So it's okay, it's legitimate to say these things. I'm not just being a Luddite. <laughs> what we need to do, and this is my challenge to you, and if you embrace this notion of mind change, is to think of ways in which we can translate information into knowledge. Because information is something that's just given to you, which is something that you might promote in pub quizzes or trivial pursuits, but no one really puts much of a premium on that. Whereas knowledge is something where a person has given their own individual perspective for linking something up with something else. Knowledge is true understanding, and it doesn't come at the press of a button. It comes by careful interaction, uh, careful thought and reflection above all time. It doesn't come by sitting in front of a screen saying yuck and wow and yuck and wow. Um, when I said this to a journalist once, they misplaced yucca wow and thought it was one word, and then it got 75,000 hits on Google within 24 hours. Um, I don't know whether that's good or bad, actually. But what we do need to do is to think about this very special um, world in which we're living. This is a shameless plug for my book, that's out. I'm currently writing a novel projecting in the future about this. But I want to leave you with the idea that it's to ask whether computers are good or bad is like asking whether a car is good or bad. It's a rather silly question. We are faced with a very complex and exciting situation unique to this century. We can't be complacent. We can't assume that it's not a problem, nor can we assume that we're going to hell in a handcart. We owe it to the next generation to deliver exciting and fulfilling lives because never before as humanity, never before, have we had the life expectancy that we are privileged to have and the leisure time that we are privileged to have. And wouldn't it be sad if the apotheosis of the human condition of human beings for the first time ever is to sit in front of a screen saying yuck and well. Thank you.